Um, at the same time, we have to uh, briefly comment on the huge flux uh, in both directions of refugees. We tend to think of refugees as something really, uh, really new, but when we realize that uh, after the Greek independence in 1830, there were 800,000 Greeks, uh, so-called Greeks in Greece, or the new state, but there are two million Greeks in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the 1860s, after the Crimean War, uh, the Tartars of Crimea, 200,000 Tartars, were uh, expelled or fled the Russians. So the Turco-Russian War was even more tragic. I won't uh, delay myself with this here because some people are going to talk about it tomorrow. But after uh, the Turkish uh, War of 1878, uh, it is estimated that this war caused 2 million refugees, uh, being 515,000 uh, Bulgarians, so that uh, even in the middle 1970s, uh, the Turkish population uh, had around 30% of the descendants of those refugees from Eastern Europe and uh, Crimea. Uh, on the other side, we have to also mention, of course, the ethnic and uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide by Turkish against the Greeks and Armenians, uh, which Paulo has already dealt with. Uh, but the two uh, issues uh, I want to deal with today in, with some detail. Uh, first is the creation of the officializing of the Greek Catholic community in 1848, and a little bit later, uh, about the massacres of uh, 1860, which Paolo, by the way, has already, yeah, we didn't, uh, we didn't talk about this before, so I had no idea. It was not a, some, some kind of uh, planned before. Uh, the question we, we have to ask here is why those uh, communities, so various communities, uh, why did they want uh, from the 17th century onwards, uh, why did they gain uh, uh, from converting or reverting, whatever term you prefer to, uh, Catholicism? Uh, the most common interpretations you have in history uh, is that because it was a uh, politics of identity, so to speak, uh, more than a question of dogma. Uh, they had some uh, political and economic interests uh, in converting to Catholicism. Uh, but this is a uh, questionable assumption, as we'll see. Uh, uh, because, uh, first, because uh, in contrast with, for example, the Bulgarian church, uh, which established itself independently from the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of uh, Constantinople, uh, the Bulgarians wanted a uh, local national church with uh, Bulgarian rights. Uh, it didn't really happen this way when we think about the Arabs who were uh, Greek Orthodox uh, in right. Uh, because w the, the demands of distinction from the, the Greek Orthodox were, uh, contrary to some nationalist historians, were not based on an ethnic character uh, of the Arab communities, Orthodox Arab communities. Uh, in fact, when we look at the, uh, at the documents, uh, the argument used by the Greek Orthodox to separate uh, and to be distinguished from uh, the Greek Orthodox were actually uh, that they were the true uh, uh, Greek Orthodox, so, so as they called sum, uh, Rum, in Syria, which they called Suriya, never actually Bilad al-Sham, which is a Muslim uh, denomination, uh, and that they were much more loyal to the Sultan uh, than the Greeks who had just uh, uh, fought a long war of independence in the uh, uh, 1820s. Uh, so uh, this demand for uh, separate recognition goes hand in hand uh, with a uh, manifestation of loyalty to the Sultan. So it not, was not an autonomous ethnic demand uh, so that they could somehow preach in Arabic and not in, uh, not in Greek. Uh, the the so-called Melkites or Greek Catholics had separated in the 1720s and uh, 1724 actually. Uh, 
uh, by a series of uh, uh, comings and goings, which I will not enter into detail now. Uh, they were recognized by the Pope in nine, 1729, and uh, they created uh, mostly with bribes, actually at some point, and mostly in Aleppo, so I won't uh, do long because repeating what Paula has already said. Uh, they gained some de facto recognition from uh, the Sultan and the local authorities. So uh, there is a time when uh, conflicts arise. Uh, usually the Muslims of Aleppo would side with the Catholics, which made up uh, the majority of the population of the city, because the Muslims didn't want the Catholics from leaving the town, which would ruin commerce. Uh, trade would, uh, wouldn't go away as well. Uh, the question is, uh, why did uh, this community uh, convert in mainly two big cities, which was uh, the Armenians who turned Catholic in Istanbul uh, and the Greek Catholics in Aleppo. Uh, one of the two main hypotheses is, uh, as was already mentioned, the presence of European uh, traders uh, and the, the desire to uh, affirmation, so to say, of Arab identity. Uh, but this ethnic explanation leaves aside the fact that a city like uh, Izmir had much stronger presence of European uh, traders and companies than the other centers, and a city which was very, very uh, throbbing heart of Arabism until today. In Damascus, most of the population did not convert to Catholicism. So uh, this explanation does not uh, fare well when you compare those two cities. Uh, one of the explanations proposed by Bruce Masters, who studied specifically the Greek Catholics in Aleppo, was that uh, spiritual, cultural, and political needs, uh, and this is quite important, of an emergent Christian mercantile bourgeoisie uh, were embraced with enthusiasm. So uh, we have a group of people who identify themselves both economically and, uh, might we say, civilizationally, uh, with uh, European missionaries and with the European uh, uh, powers to be. So uh, what we have is uh, that behind a facade of traditionalism, we have uh, the expression of uh, uh, deep-seated changes which will take shape uh, in 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, we can also note uh, the role here that was not uh, really mentioned of women, because women have more, much more restrictions in the traditional Orthodox Church than with the post-Reformation Catholic Church. The missionaries valued much more the role of uh, women who started to learn how to read and write and maybe choose the life of celibate instead of a traditional motherhood. Uh, and also culminating in the insertion in the capitalist economy in the late 19th century and the public life, though not the political life. Uh, this in turn will uh, end with the Nahda, or Renaissance, Arabic Renaissance in the end of the 19th century, which was uh, intrinsically uh, tied to the missionary uh, and political enterprise, both the missionary and the educational enterprise uh, of Europeans in the Middle East, something that was not uh, really uh, uh, stressed, as I think it should. Uh, the first uh, universities in the Middle East were created by missionaries, both the Protestant College in Beirut, now the American University of Beirut, and uh, the Université Saint Joseph, which was created uh, to counter the Protestant College by the uh, French Jesuits. Uh, another thing to stress here is that the, uh, the Melchior diaspora in the Middle East, in the Levant, uh, was pretty much tied uh, both uh, with and against European powers and traders and the local powers. So to distinguish themselves from local Orthodox was very, one might say, useful and even Machiavellian. Uh, Historica says that the diasporas of the Christian, uh, the Greek Catholic Christians in the Mediterranean seaports of Egypt and the Levant was, quote, one of the most important developments affecting trade between Egypt and Syria. Uh, in the 18th century, so that uh, most of the monopolies, uh, pr principally uh, mainly of cotton and silk, uh, they were in Egypt and uh, Palestine and the Lebanese coast, were dominated uh, incredibly by Greek Catholics. Uh, 
because the governance of those ports chose Greek Catholics uh, at the time uh, uh, instead of Jewish uh, traders. Uh, uh, the massacres also called events of 1860 that were already mentioned by uh, Paulo here. Uh, I might want to stress uh, one characteristic here uh, that this uh, uh, What one might say social division uh, of traditional society was shattered by uh, the international alliance uh, between the Lebanese government of the Shihad family and the governor uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt was at the time conquered most of Palestine was entering Anatolia. Uh, this uh, Amir Bashir Shahab II who had a long government, he allied himself uh, with the Egyptians against the former lords of the mountain, the, the Druze, so that uh, taking advantage of his position, he uh, destituted the Druze chieftains of their uh, uh, source of income, so to say. No? Uh, the lands were distributed between uh, Shihab's relatives and the Maronite church, and by the end, uh, only two uh, Druze chiefs were, uh, uh, had some possessions so that they could extract uh, taxes and so on. Uh, but uh, Bashir Shahab's government was uh, at one time uh, contested because uh, of the politics he implemented uh, following uh, the Egyptian government uh, in Syria and Lebanon. Uh, against uh, high high taxes, forced work, and military uh, military services, uh, when uh, Bashir Shahab uh, is forced out of power, uh, we are confronted with a situation uh, in which a very one might say evil dynamic ensues. First, we have a Druze block in Lebanon, which is primarily tribal, and a Christian block that has. Uh, a different dynamic with a very wide peasant and artisan commercial financial etc uh, ramifications so we might say that the Christians benefited much more from the expansion of the regional uh, trade uh, with the Europeans and the locals uh, than the other communities no. uh, as a solution to tensions between Christians and uh, Jews in the Lebanese mountain uh, was uh, really a recipe for disaster uh, it, was, it was proposed by the Austrian Chancellor Metternich, but it was devoured by him after some times. He divided the Lebanese mountain in the north uh, with the predominantly uh, Christian population and the south uh, with a 60%, one might say, Christian population, but governed by Druze. Uh, the, the events, I uh, already mentioned, the events of 1860, they were the combination of a tension that uh, followed uh, the fall of the Shahab dynasty in 1840 uh, and the beginning of the Tanzimat reforms in uh, the late uh, 1850s. Uh, the Druze uh, took the better of it. Uh, they were uh, fearful of uh, some kind of uh, possible repercussions of a peasant revolt, which I won't delve into in the north. They were fearful of losing their, their land again. Uh, as a result, a series of clashes uh, followed in which uh, the Druze massacred many Christians, for example, in the city of Deir el-Kamar, uh, in the city of Zahle, etc., and the south, uh, where Orthodox and Sunni Muslims were killed as well. Uh, an interesting fact of this, uh, of those uh, massacres in Mount Lebanon and in Damascus, uh, is uh, what resulted in it. After 1860, Lebanon had a period, sometimes it's called the Great Peace, and uh, the officer that Stambul sent to deal with uh, the events was none other than the Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is in itself significant. He tried to punish, sometimes with lenience, sometimes not, uh, the perpetrators of massacres. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, an expeditionary French force of 6,000 troops were sent 
to Lebanon in what uh, one might call the first, sometimes people call the first humanitarian intervention. I, I think it's kind of weird to say so, but anyways. Uh, but the language which uh, the Ottoman authorities treated those events and the language that the Europeans treated those events were uh, staggeringly similar. Uh, Fouad Pasha said, oh, this is all a very ancient thing that we must suppress with the enlightenment of the uh, Ottoman Empire, something that went hand in hand with European so-called uh, imperialists. So uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, separate at this time one might say uh, the colonialism of European capitalists and the very interests of the European Empire reforms, which were asserted at this time. So uh, one might say that the division in Lebanon arise from that moment on, and that sectarianism, instead of being a very old thing, as the Ottomans, uh, as the Ottoman officials uh, thought, was indeed a very modern thing created by social, economical, and uh, strategic uh, power politics. Uh, to conclude, uh, all this mishmash of uh, ideas that I just presented briefly, uh, those crucial uh, changes uh, were the reflex, of course, of religious, economical, cultural, and political influence uh, of European and European governments in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, combined with the politic, uh, politics of Ottoman reforms in the 19th century. Uh, we might note that Aleppo uh, was the center of Catholic missions and that uh, the cities, as I already mentioned, Tyre, Beirut, Sidon, and Acre, were dominated by Christian traders, which was fundamental for uh, the conversion of the Greek Catholics and other Catholics uh, to the Catholic Church. Uh, the conflict uh, in 1860 uh, served to uh, re reaffirm under the aegis of international protection and intervention the autonomy of Mount Lebanon, giving Lebanon, giving Lebanon of the seeds of its own tragic uh, separatist nationalism against all the odds of an Arabism. So, uh, I'm not praising it, one might say. Uh, sorry. Uh, on the other hand, it was fundamental for the establishment of the l'état du Grand Liban, the state of Great Lebanon, after uh, the First World War. Uh, and just as a side note, uh, the presence of missionaries and uh, educational uh, institutes, uh, schools, was very important for the creation both of uh, Lebanese, Lebanese particularism and Pan-Arab nationalism, paradoxically. So uh, we might note that the missionaries or agent, local agents uh, were a decisive uh, aspect of this product. And we might want to uh, emphasize, uh, if it can be emphasized at all, uh, the role that literacy has uh, to the diffusion of ideas and the development of nationalism, both uh, in the Balkans or in the Middle East or elsewhere. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, contrary to uh, all local, other local populations, the Maronite population was almost entirely literate. Uh, this indifferent uh, difference uh, is fundamental to explain that the, the very uh, uh, prominent uh, place that uh, the Maronite uh, church and the Maronite people have in the foundation of, of Lebanon. I think I spent all my time. That's good. Thank you very much.